thank you all for coming to Pandas from Pandas to Production Best Practices Using Effective Pandas with Matt Harrison on CoRISE. Matt Harrison is a leading consultant, author, trainer, and advisor on Python and data science. He's the author of six best selling books, including Effective Pandas, which he'll dive into today. Matt is teaching an upcoming Python for Production course on CoRISE, which launches on November 7th. This four week course will equip you with the knowledge you need to build, test, deploy, and monitor applications in a real world, real world context and covered advanced data structures, APIs, concurrency, and logging while providing you with the opportunity to practice your skills with real world projects. Today, Matt will reveal best practices for manipulating data using Pandas, including how to master predictable patterns to clean, visualize, prepare, pivot, summarize, and predict data. All right, take it away, Matt. Awesome. Thanks, Barbara. Hey, everyone. I hope you can hear me. I'm going to share my screen here and uh, pray that the uh, gods of Zoom don't crash on me. So it might be a minute or so before the share comes, but let's cross our fingers here. Okay. So I hopefully you can see my screen there and uh, we'll get going here. So Yay. Okay. So, so as Barbara said, uh, my name is Matt Harrison, and I'm going to be talking about pandas today. And I guess this is a subject that's, uh, I guess it's passionate to my heart. It's something that I, that I talk about. Um, so uh, as she said, uh, like I wrote this book, Effective Pandas, but I also wrote um, some other pandas books as well. Um, and, and so I, I've uh, got some advice and some, I guess, strong opinions about that. I'm also an advisor at a company called Modin, which is basically making pandas for the enterprise. And like Barbara said, I, I do corporate training consultings. And so I've taught pandas to thousands of folks over the years. Um, so a little bit about my background. Hopefully my font's big enough. Let me know if it if it's not. Uh, so I have a computer science degree. I did natural language processing as my first job um, back in 2000. And, and I've basically been using Python this whole time. Back in 2006, I, I created a OLAP engine in Python. Uh, 2009, I heard about pandas at PyCon. And I uh, was kind of interested in that because the OLAP engine I had created was doing a lot of things very similar to pandas, but maybe in a naive way or not quite as optimized there. So I started using pandas at work for the time to do uh, some predictive modeling and, and um, failure modeling as well. Uh, 2016, I wrote the book, Learning the Pandas Library. Uh, 2019, I had a chance to play around with Spark and their uh, data frame implementation. 2020, I did the second edition of the Pandas Cookbook. Uh, 2021, I released uh, Effective Pandas. And then uh, recently I've been uh, doing a lot with Pandas, but also uh, I've, I've used the QDF library, which is Pandas for GPU. I just got back from teaching a course on that to one of my clients. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm an advisor for Ponder, which is the main contributor to Modin. And so I've messed around with Modin quite a bit. And then um, also uh, trying out the, the Polars library as well. So uh, lots of lots of cool things going on in the Python world around data and manipulation of data. So you might wonder like why, you know, if if Python, why, why, why Python? Um, and, um, you know, when I started using Python back in like, 1999, 2000, we kind of had to hide it at the company that we were using. It wasn't necessarily a popular choice at the time. Uh, you know, full circle, uh, Py Python is now popular. And, you know, that may seem weird for like data science because it's a slow language, but um, uh, by doing some tricks, it can be relatively fast. And, uh, you know, it's used everywhere now. Number one language being taught in schools it is, I would say, the language of data science. And you know, there's over 400,000 packages on the Python package index that you can leverage using Python. So uh, 
I think it's a good choice, um, but obviously I, I'm highly biased, right? I, I, I sell snake oil for a living. So I've, I've got some opinions on pandas. Um, my outline is I'm going to talk about going over types. Um, we'll talk about chaining, mutation, um, application, and aggregation here. So, um, you know, installing pandas is relatively straightforward. Uh, I'm, uh, let me, I'm just going to re reload my notebook here and start from scratch here. <clears throat> so if you have questions, uh, feel free to ask them. You can put them in the chat. Um, there's also a Q&A widget where you can use those as well. I'll periodically be looking at those and see if, if it makes sense to answer them directly while I'm talking or if we will hold those toward, I might push those off or delay those towards the end. Um, but happy to answer any questions you might have. So I, I'm importing pandas. I've got the latest and greatest version of pandas here. I'm just going to set some options here to change what I'm displaying. And I'm going to load this data set. This is from uh, fueleconomy.gov. The U.S. government uh, lists or provides data for the cars that are sold in the U.S., like mileage data, that sort of thing. So this is a fun data set to just sort of explore. Uh, if, if you look at this data set, uh, it's got 41,000 rows and 83 columns. So it's a pretty good data set. It's got numeric entries and uh, categorical entries as well. Um, so, you know, here are all the columns. I'm not going to go through all of these columns. We'll just take a subset of those. But if you if we look at like how much memory this is using, this is using 68 megs of memory to to hold this in here as is just reading that uh, CSV file. Um, so one of the first things that I tell students to do, like I'm actually, <clears throat> I mean is to go through their data and understand what columns they have, right? And so one of the things you, you'll want to do is understand the types. And so I'm, I'm going to limit to just these columns instead of having to deal with 83 columns. So we'll just look at these columns here. And if you do the D types uh, attribute of this data frame, so this, this uh, index operation here is selecting those columns and saying with those columns, uh, tell me what those types are. Uh, you can see that we have like int64 and float64 and object. And if, if you're familiar with Python, um, you might not be familiar with int64 because int64 is not a Python type, nor is float64 a Python type. And this is kind of the dirty secret, or maybe it's not dirty, but this is the secret of pandas and why pandas is fast, because pandas is leveraging a library called NumPy. And NumPy is basically giving you the ability to work on chunks of numbers and do it at a in a quick way and a memory efficient way so modern cpus have the ability to do these simd instructions where you say here's basically a bunch of numbers and i want to add them together that happens in the cpu and so you know if you're telling it to do that from python or from c it doesn't really matter because it's a fast operation and so numpy uh, ra rather than storing each of those numbers as individual Python integers, uh, says here's a block of numbers and they're stored efficiently in RAM and uh, you can operate efficiently on memory. And so that's what N64 is here. It's coming from NumPy, not from Python. Uh, but if we look at how much memory we're using with this, um, you know, you can say, get the memory usage and there's the memory usage for each of those columns. Uh, you'll note that like some of these are significantly higher. Generally, that's because like these ones that are stored as strings or objects um, uh, take a little bit more. Uh, object is a Python type. And so that's another note that you might not be aware of. So strings in Python or in pandas, pandas really doesn't, I mean, there, there is a categorical value, but uh, as far as like just uh, arbitrary Python strings are not really an optimized way of representing that in pandas. Now, some of these other implementations do, like the QDF library uh, has the ability to uh, do string manipulation on the GPU. And so you, if you do string manipulation, you're getting, you know, 600 or however many threads you tell it to use. Uh, it can do that on your strings 
on the GPU very quickly, but pandas really doesn't give you that. How pandas represent strings is it says here's a NumPy array, but rather than being a buffer of numbers, it's a buffer of pointers pointing back to the raw Python strings. So when you're using numbers in pandas, you, you kind of get that fast C speed. When you're using strings, you're, you're reverting to Python, but you know, it's a trade-off a lot of people are willing to use because Python has a lot of great manipulation for strings and you know, a lot of string operations are kind of slow in and of themselves. Um, but if we look at how much memory this is using, this is using 19 megs with uh, this uh, amount of data that we're using here. So um, what I like to do is just sort of go through the columns, try and understand them a little bit, and then make sure that the types are correct, right? And so one of the things you can do, and I, I've got this operation here where I'm saying pull off those columns, then we're going to select uh, certain types that are integers, and then I'm going to do the describe on that. And so I, what I get back from doing this is a data frame. The data frame is pandas two dimensional representation of this. And in the index, that's this thing in the bold on the left-hand side, you see the summary statistics, the names of those. And along the top, you see the columns that I applied this to. So this is really good for, for uh, understanding what's going on here. We see the minimum, the maximum, the inner quartiles there. We see the mean, the standard deviation. And we see the count here. Just a, as an aside, count probably isn't what you think it means. Uh, it's not the number of rows. To pandas, count is the number of non-missing values. Uh, so it turns out that pandas it, it can't store an int 64 as a, with missing values. So uh, all of these values should be this 41,144 entry here. Now, another thing you might want to do is just sort of look, you know, where the mean is and the median, get a feel for that. But also where the max is, you can see like some of these are maxing out at like 124. And note that we're using a 64-bit integer to store a number that maxes out at 124. So that might not be the most effective uh, storage mechanism. I mean, as you can see, most of these are, are actually pretty small, right? They, you know, 150, 136, the year goes up to 2020, but most of these are relatively small. So we're maybe using a little bit more memory because we're using those 64-bit integers for that. Now, I've written this up above here as a single line, but one of the things you'll see in this talk is that I really like to write this as a chain. So what I do when I'm writing as a chain is I put parentheses around it. And that basically is a parenthetical. Python white space is important, but when you're inside of a parenthetical, either inside of parentheses or square brackets or curly braces, white space rules are ignored. And so what this allows me to do is put each of these operations on its own line. And so this is what I'll do. This makes it really clear that like, here's my original data frame that I'm gonna pull off the columns that I want. And I'm going to select the types that I want. And then on that, I'm going to do a describe there. So if you format it like this, it's exactly the same code as we have up above here, but it's just a small matter of formatting that allows you to read this as a recipe rather than this long line that's sort of visually overwhelming and, and uh, confusing. So that's, that's my first hint. If you embrace this chaining style, it will make your life a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, what can we do with these numbers here? Like I can ask NumPy, again, Pandas is built on NumPy, what is the integer info for an int 8? And it says an int 8 can go from negative 128 to 127. So maybe I can put, you know, this uh, highway mileage as an int 8. Um, there's also unsigned integers. It turns out that these values can't go negative. So maybe I want to use an unsigned integer that has a minimum value of 0 and goes up to 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 255. Uh, we're using eight bits of, of memory for each number there instead of uh, 64 bits. So, so a sa savings of eight um, by doing that. So let's just try this here. I'm going to say, um, take my columns that I want. That's going to give me my data frame. I'm, I'm getting, I can just comment these out and sort of uh, walk through this, right? So here, here's my original data. I'm going to pull out the columns that I want, and I'm going to use this as type operation. And that's going to say, here's here's the columns that we have, and uh, convert highway to an int 8, convert city to an int 16, convert combined to a uint um, 8 here. Um, and then, you know, I can say, select all the integers that are in there, or some subset of those, and then I can do a describe on those and sort of make sure that my uh, ranges there make sense uh, for, for what's going on. So that looks like that's uh, relatively good. Um, and 
you know, we can look at these and see that, uh, okay, some th these look like, uh, you know, they are okay. So uh, going through and, and fixing up those types is one thing. Now I've got in, in my notebook here, and I'll make the notebook available to those who want it. Um, you can reach out to me on Twitter and I'll, I'll give you access to the notebook here. Um, in the notebook here, I've got a bunch of content on going through the other column types and sort of cleaning those up. So talk about uh, dealing with floats here and dealing with string objects here and dealing with dates. Um, but for the sake of time, since we don't have a lot of time, we're just going to skip those. Um, I mean, it's basically the same process I did with those integers, trying to figure out what the appropriate type is. Um, at, at the end, I've, I, what I've done is I've built up this chain of operations here that looks something like this, um, where I've changed some types, but I've also created some new columns or updated some columns using the assigned statement here. Um, and then I'm going to stick that into a uh, function here. Now, a lot of people, if you, some of you might follow me on social media, and I tend to post a lot of code. I don't post a lot of cat pictures on social media, but I post a lot of code. And I get a lot of comments from people who see my code and are like, this is overwhelming, right? There's like, how did you do this? Well, the notebook that I just sort of skipped over is how I do it. I build up the chain. So I don't just come to a data set and say, here's a chain and, and start off with a chain, right? I'm debugging this and building it up as I go along. But what I can also do is I can come in here and uh, I can walk through this, like I said, as a recipe and see what's going on here. So I'm just going to comment this out. And like I said, I, I don't have time to like go over all those, uh, you know, each of those sections about what I did, but, but we can see like, here's my original data frame, right? And then what I'm going to do is pull off these columns. So this reads like a recipe, right? And then the next thing I'm going to do is this assign, assign will create or uh, update columns. So like cylinders, I'm going to take the cylinders column, fill the missing values with zero, and then convert that to an integer. And you can just run that. And, and this is what I did. I basically did that. Okay, that looks like that worked. And then displacement, this is engine displacement. I'm going to fill in the missing values with zero and, and cast that as a float 16. Let's just run that. It looks like that works. The drive column, I'm going to pull off the drive and this is a categorical. I'm going to fill any missing values with the other and then convert that to a category. And okay, that looks like that works. You can sort of see, I mean, th th this literally like looks like do this step, do this step, do this step, right? Automatic, whether the transmission column contains the string auto is whether it's an automatic. And I can come down here and just check whether that worked. Um, so this is going to stick a new column at the end called automatic. And you see that we've got false and true. So it looks like, you know, this one that had auto in, in tranny is an automatic car. Um, so speeds here, this is also from the transmission. I'm going to use a regular expression to extract a number from that. If there are missing vowels, I'll fill that in with 20. And then I'm going to convert that to an integer. And uh, it looks like um, when I run that, we should have a speeds column here. And lo and behold, we do. So that looks like that's good. Uh, created on, this is going to take the date column and convert that into uh, the New York time zone. Uh, that involved a little bit more work, but I mean, basically we're calling this PD2 date time using a little string replacement there. And then I'm using, once it's converted into UTC time, I'm converting it into that time zone right there. And then I'm making this column called FFS. Uh, which is just pulling off a feature from the engine description, whether the feature contains FFS. And it looks like that works as well. So, uh, you know, this this might be a little bit overwhelming and there's a lot of code here, but you can walk through this and see what's going on. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is just this as type. That's just going to do type conversions there. And so we'll do a bunch of type conversions. That looks like that works. I mean, if I want, I can come down here and look at D type. And there's the D types there. So it looks like, you know, I, I don't really have too many in 64s. Um, I've got like a transmission that's an object, but I've got a lot of categoricals as well. And now, oh, let's drop transmission and engine description. And this is what we're left with, something that looks like this. Okay, so the nice thing about this is that it's all in one place. I can take this code now, and the next time I need to work on this autos data set, I just move this to the top of my notebook, and, and I have everything in one place. I'm ready to go, rather than having to fight through 30 different cells trying to figure out what's going on.
Um, there's a question from uh, someone who says, is there a way to view each transformation in the chain without manually commenting it uh, or uncommenting it? Um, I guess I, I'd sort of ask you why you want to look at each transformation in the chain. So um, again, I'm building this up from scratch. So as I'm building it up, I'm actually looking at each transformation and, and sort of double checking it. But my goal here is not to make 50 different ind intermediate objects. My goal here is that I want to clean this up and have the end cleanup data frame. So um, uh I, I guess I'd sort of flip that back. Why do you want to look at the intermediate ones, right? Um, I'll actually show a way to do that without commenting it out here in a moment here. But, uh, you know, a lot of people are like, this is hard to debug or it's hard to understand. It's like, I'm debugging it as I'm going along. And I, I actually think it's a lot easier to understand once you get used to the, if you format it this way, it looks like individual steps in a recipe. Um, Okay, so contrast that, uh, if we look at that, we're now at 1.6 megs. Uh, again, we had 19 megs before. So by going through this process, uh, we're, we're saving like in this case, 90% uh, of the memory that we started with. Remember the original data set, I think it was around 60 plus megabytes and we're down to like 1.6 megabytes. Um, and just an, as an aside, this is important in Pandas because Pandas um, is a small memory tool. You need to be able to fit your data in memory to use pandas and so uh, because of how we use pandas we want a little bit of overhead in that so uh, reducing that size and making sure that your types are correct is going to make it so you can work on your data faster and possibly uh, work on your data if it, you know a naive loading of your data might not get uh, the correct data in there now this is uh, chaining it, it, like I said, it, it's somewhat controversial. I'll post code like this on the internet. I posted some code last week and people are like, that's the worst code I've ever seen. Um, my, my question to them or my response is, okay, I, I spend a lot of my time as an educator. Like I teach people how to write code and I want to learn. So if there's a better way to do it, I'm certainly open to that. I've also spent my uh, use pandas more than most people. And so, you know, I spent a lot of my time writing pandas code that looks like this, which is what you see in most people write pandas code, right? So they're just making all these intermediate objects and, and sort of going on. Now I've put this all in one cell, but generally people will put this in like 20 or 30 cells. And so it gets pretty messy pretty quickly, but you also, you know, when you run this, you get a bunch of these warnings here about like the setting with copy warning. Uh, sort of hinting that like your code may or may not be doing what you want. You'll note that like up here, I don't get any warnings when I do this. It just works and I don't have to worry about any of those issues. So not only am I saving memory by not making intermediate variables, I, I mean, this code is, you can say it's easy to read and that each line is doing something, but it's kind of a mess because now we have a cognitive overload where our brain has like 50 different variables it needs to keep track of. In this case, we don't need to do that up above here. Um, okay, just looking at the, the comments, um, okay, or questions. Okay, so there was a question like, how can I look at the intermediate variable? So yeah, you can do that without commenting them out if you want to, and so that's what this is doing. So people say like, how do you debug that? I mean, I think commenting it out is a really easy way to debug, um, but there's other things we can do as well, right? So. Um, if I want to, I can leverage the pipe ability here. And so pipe is a method on pandas. And basically you pass in a function that takes the data frame and it can return whatever it wants. If I return a data frame, then I can keep chaining here. So I'm going to pipe in this get variable function. Guess what that's going to do? It's going to make a variable called df3 with the intermediate state. And so all I do is pass in the current state of the data frame and use Python to make a, a variable. And then I just return the current state of the data frame. And you can stick this wherever you want with whatever variable name you want and uh, you can get the current state of the data frame at that point. Um, I, here I've got another pipe, which is saying like display that. Uh, another thing that you might wanna do is you might wanna do a pipe where you say like um, print df.shape. Okay, and then, you know, this is kind of nice. You can say, here's my original shape up here. And, and I have 14 columns on that, and maybe before that, you want to see what happens up here. 
So I just put that pipe up there. I start off with 83 columns and I have 14 columns and I have 17 columns. Um, you can also see like I've got this display here. So if, if we look at the output here, uh, it's actually showing the intermediate column here. If we scroll down a little bit more, this is actually the output of this. So you can see that it's doing that. But then I also made a variable in here called DF3. This is that intermediate column that someone asked about how to do that. Um, so uh, the, that's how I would debug it if I needed to. And there's a question about what does a sign do? So a sign, if you're not familiar with a sign, um, a sign is the way that I recommend to create or update columns. Um, so I'm going to link in here to a blog post that I wrote for Ponder um, about the assign method here. So I'll just put that into the group chat. And um, it's an article that it talks about chaining and assign there. So check that out if you've never used assign. Um, Okay, yeah, if you're not on Twitter, um, you can email me, um, John, and uh, I can I can get you that notebook, or if, if you want to reach out on LinkedIn, that's probably a good place to do that. Okay, um, so another thing that you get from this chaining is if you put it into a function, then that enables testing, right? Uh, a lot of people who are using pandas don't really use software engineering best practices, so they do a bunch of bad things like make global variables, that sort of thing. So simply by putting this into a function makes it really easy to move around. I like to put it right at the top of my notebook so I can just load my raw data and then clean it up. Uh, I can, uh, you know, put it in a file and we can deploy it if we need to. It makes it easy to reuse. Um, all of those things are sort of enabled with the functions, but also uh, the chaining is going to make that easier as well. Uh, one one comment I, I also get as well is like people are like, well, Pandas has all these in-place operations. There's all these parameters on these methods where you can do in-place. Um, and that's true. There are a, a bunch of parameters where you can say in place is equal to true. And if you do in place is equal to true, pandas on the operation does not return a data frame. It just updates the existing data frame. People are like, well, you know, by using in place equals to true, you save all this memory. And it turns out you actually don't save memory. Um, if you look at the implementation of most in place methods, what they do is they actually make a copy and then they change the thing that you wanted it to do. And then they set the uh, old value to the new copy that they just made. So, so there's not really a memory savings by doing that. Um, it does prohibit chaining because you no longer return a data frame. And then you also get uh, these setting with copy warnings issues that I showed you up above here. In fact, one of the core developers, uh, Mr. Reback, Jeff Reback, um, uh, has said about this, you're missing the point in place really to something in place. You're thinking you're saving memory, but you're not. And there's actually a bug here, an issue to remove in place from pandas completely. Uh, what you'll see is that most folks who are experienced with pandas um, or are developers of pandas really favor this chaining style, um, though you don't really see it in like a lot of blog posts or a lot of like the towards data science medium type content because a lot of people are regurgitating uh, basic intro uh, introductory material, but also they're showing a, a, a single operation in isolation. So they're showing this is how you do one thing with pandas. And one thing is nice, but really I don't want to do one thing to my data. I want to do a bunch of things, right? And so the chain is how I do those bunch of things. But a lot of people don't really realize that they can do this chaining because there aren't very many examples of it in the wild. Um, question, my handle on Twitter is Dunder M. Harrison, underscore, underscore, M. Harrison, underscore, underscore. Okay. Um, let's see, there's another question. Wouldn't a for loop be more memory efficient than chain syntax? With the chain syntax, you need to keep all the intermediate steps around for longer. Um, so uh, the person who asked that, 
uh, generally, if you're using a for loop with pandas, your spidey sense should go off. That should be a hint that you're doing things wrong. Um, we don't want to use for loops. We want to use pandas operations because that pushes that code down to that NumPy layer and it makes things happen quickly. When you're doing for loops, you're operating at the Python level and you're getting slow speeds. So you don't really want to manipulate numbers with a for loop. Uh, you sort of got two questions there, one about using for loops, the other one about uh, chains using more memory. Uh, chains don't use more memory. Uh, they actually use less memory than not chaining. The reason why is because when you're making a chain, you have the intermediate variables, but Python does garbage collection for you. So if no one is using that intermediate variable, and so what's going to happen is the first thing is going to use the intermediate variable, and then it's going to go to the next data frame, which no longer uses that other intermediate variable, which goes away at that point. Uh, so you, you get that cleanup of that automatically by doing chaining. If you don't do chaining, uh, which most people don't, they write code like I showed up above. They make all these intermediate variables. Those don't get garbage collected because they're intermediate variables. So uh, by using chain, you save memory. And by not using for loops, you go faster. Um, Um, so, I mean, Vel's posting a, a piece of code that says it will be much faster and I'm, I'm not going to get into that now, but, um, you can take my advice or you could ignore it, um, your choice. Um, okay. So another thing is don't apply if you can. Um, and so here, here is, here is my data uh, right here. I'm, I'm just going to run this here. Whoops. And, um, you know, th this is US centric, maybe I want to be more Eurocentric instead of miles per gallon, I want liters per 100 kilometers or 100. Uh, so uh, th the calculation to do that is this calculation right here, I take 235 and divide it by miles per gallon, and I get that. And this works, I can do something like this, where I say pull off the city column, and use apply and apply this function to that. This is sort of functional programming. It looks like it's giving us a result that works. Um, however, um, I can get the same result here by just saying uh, take 235 and divide it by this column um, right here. And so, um, so you might see like, why would I want to do that? Well, again, this first operation here is going at the pand at the Python level because we're passing in a Python function, whereas this one is going to use those vectorized broadcast operations that are very fast. In fact, I can time this here using Jupyter here to time it. On my machine, I'll just cut to the chase. It's generally around 50 times slower to use the Python operation uh, rather than uh, the fast pandas one. So we're talking about and on this run here, it was nine milliseconds versus uh, 200 microseconds. Um, so depending on how much stuff is running on my machine, um, you know, th this varies from anywhere from like 100 microseconds uh, to, to more microseconds up there. So uh, just be aware of that. Again, if, if you're using apply, especially with numeric operations, uh, you're going that slow path here. Um, now, I mentioned before that strings are a little bit different. If you use strings, um, uh, strings aren't really optimized in pandas. So, uh, you know, if I want to say is something an American car, I can use this is American. And if you do this, you'll see that, um, you know, there's an is in here. But is in really isn't like vectorized because these aren't, if you think about how these are stored under the covers, um, we get basically the same speed with both of these operations here. So just, just be aware of that, um, uh, that if you're using strings, uh, I'm kind of okay with apply there, but uh, otherwise I, I wouldn't use it here. I'm going to skip the rest of these timings here and let's, because for sake of time, let's go down to this aggregation here. One thing you might want to do is, is learn how to do aggregates or pivots. So your boss says, uh, I want to see mileage by country by year. So when you hear by year, by country, you might think I need to start doing what are called pivot tables here. So this is actually relatively straightforward in Pandas. It says, it, because it says by year, we can say, let's group by year and take the mean. 
and uh, that gives us a data frame back. So here's a data frame in the index. We have what we grouped by, and then we have the mean of all these numeric columns here. So, I mean, literally, this is one line of code to do this. I've written it as four lines of code because I highly suggest suggest that you follow this chain style where one line is doing one operation here. Um, if I want to pull off certain columns, so here is just the combined and the speed mean right there. If I want to plot this, um, I can just stick a plot at the end of this and pandas makes it easy to plot. So here's the plot. Um, let me just explain how plotting works really quickly here. In pandas, when you call plot, you're going to do a line plot by default. Um, it's going to plot the index, this thing in bold, along the x-axis, and each column will be its own line. So uh, you'll see along the bottom here, we have the year, and each column is its own line right there. So really easy to get visualization on top of that. Um, so when, once you've got this sort of build up, you can uh, sort of go to town on it. Here I'm saying, uh, let's take the 30th percent quantile and let's plot that. But, you know, if I want to do the median instead, I can look at the median here. Or I want the standard deviation, I can put the standard deviation in there. And you can, uh, you know, change these really quickly. If I want to stick in highway mileage up here, I can come in here and say highway 08 and stick that column up there and compare all of these. So once you've got this sort of flushed out, um, it makes it really easy to uh, try things out. Um, now, we wanted to look at country by year, so let's uh, try and do that. I'm going to make a new column here called country using a sign, and then I'm going to say group. Well, we'll just walk through this. Like I said, it's really easy to debug these right here. Here's our original data frame. Let's assign a new column called country. If I look on the right, we'll see a country column over here. Let's group by year and country. That's lazy. It doesn't do anything. I'm going to plot these columns. This is still lazy until we do an aggregation, and it will give us this aggregation here. So you can see now in the index, I have what's called a multi-index. I've got year and country in there, and then I've got the means for combined and speed. Uh, I can also stick in uh, multiple aggregations here. So here I'm going to say I want to aggregate the mean, the minimum, the mean, and I'm defining my own aggregation, second to last. And you can do that. And, and not only can you get hierarchical index, but you can get hierarchical columns as well. So I'm going to go back to my simpler one here. Um, here is a uh, country and uh, year, and let's plot this. What this is going to plot is the index and the x-axis. So when you plot this, you actually get something silly. You get these tuples here in the x-axis, which probably isn't what you want here. So what we need to do is we need to introduce this other operation here. So this is what we had before. We want to do this unstack. Watch what this unstack does. It takes the innermost index and it's going to flip it up into the columns here. This is kind of cool. Now in the index here, I've just got the years and then I've got hierarchical columns over here. Um, given that, what I can do is I can say, okay, um, Here's what we have. Uh, let's pull off just the city. That's going to give us the US versus other uh, sub data frame from that. And then let's plot that. Here's the plot of that. If I want to kick this legend around, I can move that if I want to. And that sticks it on the outside. So this is a plot that shows um, the city mileage, the mean city mileage of US makers versus other makers by year. Um, again, this is one line of code. I've written it out as multiple lines of code here, but you could write this as one line of code to do this. So once you start mastering these aggregations, it makes it really uh, cool to do things. Um, here, I'm just going to add uh, a smoothing of it. I'm going to uh, add rolling to smooth on top of that. And so you can see that that smooths it out. Um, here I'm going to um, uh, show another example here. So that so this is, this is one more example of um, you know looking at uh, Tesla, Honda, Toyota, and Ford, and looking at the mean city mileage by year. So uh, this is how I would do that. Again, I can come in here and I can uh, sort of walk through these steps of what's going on here. So here's, here's my data frame. I'm going to filter this by the makes, and then I'm going to uh, group by your make. That's lazy. I'm going to pull off the city column. Still lazy. Let's do an aggregation. So there's the mean. This is a series. 
um, with a hierarchical index here. Let's unstack that. And that gives us the data frame there. Um, I'm going to reorder the columns here. So you, I have this make list. And so Tesla will be first after I do this. And then I'm going to plot this. And plot's going to take the index, plot that in the x-axis, and each of these columns will make a line. So that's what we get here. Um, you know, I think this is an okay plot. Um, this last uh, cell, I'm just going to show you like uh, pandas uses matplotlib under the cover. So you can, with matplotlib, customize this to your heart's content. And so what I've done here is I've basically uh, customized this to look like it's from The Economist. If you look at like a plot from The Economist, it will look something similar to this. So this is, you know, adding a bunch of options here just to change that. And I think this is actually a relatively nice looking plot. Uh, your eye is drawn immediately to Tesla and uh that's where your eye is going to go due to like some trickery that we're using with coloring there. And it tells a little bit different story than this generic plot here. So generic plots are great for trying stuff out. If you need to stick something in a presentation or share it with someone else, you might want to spend a little bit more time with it. Okay, um, we're at the end here. So in summary, um, Correct uh, types are going to save you space and memory, and that's important because Pandas is an in-memory tool. Uh, chaining operations, uh, it's going to make your life easier. Um, I, I found that every Pandas expert that I talk to chains. Uh, you can read reviews of my book. Lots of people are like, this completely changed how I write Pandas code. Um, don't mutate. Um, embrace chaining. Uh, apply is slow for math. Aggregations, I get that those might be a little bit overwhelming. There's sort of a lot going on there. But once you start playing around with them and understand them, they're super powerful and super useful and can answer questions relatively quickly. Um, I, as was mentioned, uh, we've got an upcoming course on Python for production. So if you're wanting to learn how to leverage Python in a production environment and best practices, uh, check that out. I also do a bunch of other courses as well on pandas and machine learning topics. So if you follow me on Twitter or, or LinkedIn, you'll hear about those as well. I've got a discount code here for my coupon for my book. Um, I'll copy this link here. And um, if you go to this, this will give you a discount code uh, for my book there, the co rise discount code. Okay, um, let's see what questions we have here. Let's see, the first one, uh, really confused about the large number of data frame libraries that are available, how to choose between Pandas, Polars, Modin, or Spark. Yeah, so uh, here, here's sort of a rule of thumb. If you're dealing with small data, I think Pandas is a great place to start. It's sort of the de facto, it integrates well with lots of other things like machine learning libraries, et cetera. Um, if you need to scale out, right, um, that sort of depends on what you want to do. So Modin is going to allow you to do scale out. Um, but the, the key, the nice thing about Modin is it preserves the Pandas API. So you, uh, you can take your Pandas code, change the import and import Modin instead. And now you can scale out with the same code there. Um, Spark, if you're already in sort of the Spark land, um, they do have a what they call the Pandas API. It's not good. so so Modin is going to like basically go to the extent that like they're going to replicate Pandas bugs in the Modin API, whereas uh, Spark is going to say here's an API that's like 80% the same, but it has some differences and had different behavior. So that may or may not be the right choice for you, depending on what you want. And then, you know, you've got Polars and like QDF and other things. So Polars is a different API. It's similar, but um, uh, it has a lot more modern thinking. Also, it, it embraces chaining even more and it can do fancy things because of chaining. For example, uh, it has a lazy mode where if you uh, enable lazy mode, you can say, I want to read this CSV file and then do all this processing. And then at the end, you do a filter on columns and rows. That final filter on the columns and rows will actually tell the, the CSV reader to only read certain rows from the CSV file and certain columns. So it, it can do some cool things because of chaining. Um, so that might be something to check out. Um, Yeah, if you're interested in, in the notebook, you can reach out to me and I, I can get you access to the notebook. Um, um, let's see. How do we, can we categorize the variable that would improve the speed? 
Um, so there are category var categorical variables in, in pandas. And so if you use a categorical variable for a low cardinality string, that can in improve the speed. So that is an option for improving speed. Uh, someone says, sometimes due to a few rows missing some columns, the row values will be shifted left. Please suggest a way to deal with data where the values are shifted to other columns. Huh, I've never seen that. Um, to me, that's an issue with the data source. Um, and um, I mean, presumably how it, whatever's exporting that, like a CSV file, um, if it's shifted left in the CSV file, to me, that's an issue with like the CSV file generation. Um, I mean, Pandas certainly has ways to like uh, say, you know, if this file is, if this column zero, make it or empty, make it this value. So, so there's like if else statements that you can do in Pandas to move data around that way. But to me, that sounds like an issue with the export. I mean, I'll also say this, Pandas read CSV is like the most complicated function in Pandas. It's got like 50 different parameters. And so if Pandas read CSV can't handle it, um, that that seems like that's problematic. Um, is there a way to leverage Dask pandas with Dask for large data? Yeah, yeah. So Dask basically does scale out of pandas as well. Um, should data types for columns be manually optimized? Uh, so I manually optimize them. I'm a huge fan of going through the columns and looking at them individually, especially because I do a lot of predictive modeling and general rule of thumb is the more you understand your columns and clean them up and the better you can make them, the better you can make your model. You can use a simpler model with better data rather than making a more complicated model with worse data. So I actually like to spend time uh, looking at my data, my columns, looking at the types. I'll, I'll do summary statistics. I'll plot and visualize them as well. Um, Someone says the data has a shifting issue, but how to shift the columns to make the data right? Yeah, so I mean, you can use assign to make new columns from other columns. I mean, without more details, I can't really go into that, but like pandas has the ability to like do if else statements and move columns around that sort of way. Uh, Okay, last question here. I noticed in the tweak autos function, you change some columns with the assign and others with as type. What's the reasoning for now including the columns that were altered with as type with the assign? Um, so assign is a generic create a new column or update a column. As, uh, as type is just going to change the type. So um, if I just need to change the type, I can use as type. I can also do that with assign. It's a little quicker to do that with as type. Okay, um, thanks so much, everyone. A pleasure being with you. I'll, I'll kick it back over to Barbara to let her take us out of here. Sure, thank you everyone for coming. I will follow up with the recording for all the attendees. And if you're interested in hearing more from Matt, um, check out his upcoming Python for production course launching on November 7th. I will drop the link in the chat and we'll see you all soon. Bye everyone. Thank you, Matt.